Good afternoon, everyone. May the Lord bless our worship and our fellowship. The call to worship comes from Psalm 149. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song, His praise in the assembly of the godly. Congregation, from where does your help come? Amen. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Amen. Let us praise our God, singing Psalm 35, stanzas 1 and 2. Let us unite together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise Your name. We've just done so in singing together. We continue to do so in this prayer. Your name is great. You and You alone are God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There simply is no other God. There's lots of pretenders, there's lots of false gods in this world, but you are the only true God. We thank you for making yourself known to us. We praise you for creating this world and creating us in this world and granting to us the blessing of a relationship with you. Even despite our sins, you take us to yourself in and through your Son, Jesus Christ. In Him, in His blood, you cleanse us from our sin, and in His Spirit, whom you have given to live within us, you fellowship with us. You commune 
with us. You communicate with our hearts, and we may communicate with you. We're so very thankful for this privilege that we may do it every moment of every day individually as families, but then every Lord's Day again as congregation. You call us here to gather with each other in your presence. And so you commune with us here in a special way. We are the temple of your Holy Spirit. And what a great blessing and privilege that is. We pray, Father, that you would indeed bless us still more with the preaching of your word. Open our hearts to receive it. Open our ears to understand it. As we speak once more about how you want your church to be governed and how the deacons, elders, and minister of the church must be careful to govern the flock as Christ himself would do so. Help us to understand the limits. Also help us to understand our role as members of the flock, how we are to honor and respect those ambassadors you have sent us, and how we are to encourage and support them in their roles. Lord, bless us in these, uh, this afternoon in this way. May the preaching then strengthen faith, give clarity to us concerning the matter of church government, and may we go home from here encouraged and instructed and enlightened. In Jesus' name, we ask all these things. Amen. Let's open the Bible together to the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew 15, page 1043. And then we'll read a few verses from Galatians chapter 5. And let's start in Matthew 15 page 1043. As I mentioned, we're dealing with Article 32 of the Belgic Confession, which concludes what we as church confess the Bible teaches about the government of the church. And in Matthew 15, the Lord Jesus addressed the, the rulers of the church of His day, while he was on earth, the Pharisees and the other scribes and leaders, and he has to dress them down for their hypocrisy. So let's listen to what he says in Matthew 15. Then Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. He answered them, And why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, If anyone tells his father or his mother, What you would have gained from me is given to God, he need not honor his father. So, for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. You hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And he called the people to him and said to them, hear and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth. This defiles a person." Then the disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. Let them alone. They are blind guides, and if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, Explain the parable to us. And he said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, 
theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. Let's turn now to Galatians 5, page 1239. 1239. And we'll read the first six verses. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace, for through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. So far the Holy Scriptures. Let's sing together in preparation for the preaching. Psalm 3, all three stanzas.
I invite you to turn with me in the Book of Praise to page 512, where we have Article 32. This is what we as church confess the Bible teaches concerning the order and discipline of the church. We believe that, although it is useful and good for those who govern the church to establish a certain order to maintain the body of the church, they must at all times watch that they do not deviate from what Christ, our only Master, has commanded. Therefore, we reject all human inventions and laws introduced into the worship of God, which bind and compel the consciences in any way. We accept only what is proper to preserve and promote harmony and unity and to keep all in obedience to God. To that end, discipline and excommunication ought to be exercised in agreement with the Word of God. That's as far as our confession goes. In response to the preaching, we will sing about the freedom that Christ gives us from Psalm 40. He sets our feet upon a rock, and that rock, of course, is His own work, His own saving work on our behalf. Brothers and sisters in our Lord Jesus Christ, by now in this series of sermons on the Belgic, we've seen from the Bible how the good shepherd, a good shepherd governs each local church by means of men that he chooses to do so at certain times, deacons, elders, ministers. Those are the three permanent offices. He ordains them to have authority in the flock, over the flock, as His ambassadors, and they are charged with caring for the flock, just like the Lord Jesus Himself would care for the flock. He, they are to be His agents in that shepherding care. And part of that is necessarily for those leaders to make rules for the flock. But now the question of Article 32 is, how far can these rules go? And how far must individual members of the flock obey their decisions, the decisions of the rulers? This question comes up because not everything concerning how the church is to be run and all the finer details, not everything is spelled out in the Bible directly. There are certain gray areas even, which leave open room for opinion and interpretation about how we worship. So, for example, should we have a worship service on Ascension Day, which is a Thursday, always a Thursday? Should we have a Thursday night worship service to mark the Ascension of Christ? Some churches do. Some churches celebrate the Lord's Supper around a table. In Ancaster, we celebrate it in the pew. Is one way correct, the other way wrong? We celebrate the Lord's Supper six times per year. Some do it four times a year. Some do it once a month. There's other frequencies. What is correct? How do we gauge these kinds of things? Is the consistory free to make just any rules it wishes? Is a member of the congregation free to disobey any rules that they don't like? Well, we hope to tackle some of these questions this afternoon as I bring you this word of the Lord. For freedom, Christ has set us free. For freedom, Christ has set us free. And His government, through these office bearers, brings us two things, freedom of conscience and freedom of of submission. So this whole question of how far 
office bearers can go with making rules for the congregation, that was a major issue in the time of the Reformation. We've seen it in other issues throughout the Belgic Confession that the, the author has in mind what the Roman Catholic Church, Church was teaching on the one hand and the Anabaptists on the other. Well, here it's primarily the Anabaptists, or sorry, primarily the Roman Catholic Church that is the concern. And the big problem with the Roman Church back then and still today is that it feels no qualms, no hesitation about making all kinds of rules and regulations for the people to follow. The Roman Church does this because they are convinced that they speak for the Lord Jesus Christ apart from what is revealed in Scripture. So we all know, and even the Roman Catholics recognize, that Scripture is God's Word to the church, to His people. You might remember way back in Articles 5 and 7 of the Belgic, when we talked about the authority of the Word, that the Roman Church certainly acknowledge, acknowledges the authority of the Word, but right alongside of it professes itself, the Roman Church, to be the interpreter, the necessary interpreter of the Word of God. They even insist that you cannot rightly understand the Word of God, the Bible, on its own. It has to be clarified. It has to be interpreted in order for people to really grasp what it is saying. And Rome is the authoritative interpreter. And on top of that particular power that they accrue to themselves, Rome also believes that Jesus Christ continues to speak through the official Roman church decisions to the church today. So you probably remember that they believe each pope carries on the line of popes, and they believe it goes all the way back to the first apostles, even to Peter, who was the bishop of Rome, they say. And just like Christ spoke through Peter, so Christ still speaks through the, uh, through the Pope today. So when Pope Francis of today makes a declaration, an official declaration, that is understood as Christ making a declaration. That's Christ speaking. This is their theology. So not only do they believe themselves to be the official interpreters of the Bible, in an authoritative way, but also they have the authority to render other judgments and decrees. And they, they bundle all of this together in something they call, with a capital T, tradition. This is the tradition of the Roman church. Not, that's not just customs like we often use the word tradition. We've got this tradition in our midst, but for them that's an authoritative body of teaching from Christ through the church. Now, that tradition, that interpretation, and those decrees over the course of centuries led to a great many rules and regulations being placed on believers, particularly in their worship. And that's what Article 32 keys in on. Let me give a few examples of the Roman regulations that have been imposed upon their members. Instead of the two sacraments that the Bible teaches, they insist on seven sacraments, including marriage, including the last rites, including the need to confess your sins to the priest. They also enacted a rule to forbid priests to marry. Rome introduced the teaching of transubstantiation, where the elements of bread and wine in the supper they teach are genuinely changed into the physical body and blood of Christ. Rome demands that everyone believe in the holy water of baptism, which they say has power, the water has power to wash away sins. They teach the existence of purgatory. That's that in-between place, they say. After you die, as a believer, you go to purgatory and Extra works done by somebody on earth can help you get out of purgatory onto heaven eventually. Rome teaches also the veneration, as they say, the veneration of the saints, praying to them in a worshipful way. 
and they have a number of other kinds of teachings. None of these are in the Bible, but over time they have imposed them as obligations on everyday believers. Well, now you can better understand why Guido de Bray and the Reformers were on to this and were reacting to this here in Article 32. The opening sentence, we believe that although it is useful and good for those who govern the church to establish a certain order to maintain the body of Christ, they must at all times watch that they do not deviate, that means turn away from what Christ, our only master, has commanded. You can hear in that sentence, uh, restraint. It's a check and balance. It's good to have a certain order in the church, but... And the trouble is, Rome had forgotten the but. Rome had usurped the headship of Christ, claiming to act on His behalf, when in fact the very rules that they imposed on the people led them away from the true worship of the Good Shepherd. And that is the bottom line issue. Here, Jesus Christ is the only master of the church. It's His voice that has to be heard loud and clear in all things, and He must be worshipped according to His Word. The pure gospel of His Word has to come through in everything that the church does. It has to be given free reign. It may not be covered over. It cannot be mixed in with false teaching. It cannot be obscured, much less overturned by the rules of men. That's driven home in the second sentence of Article 32. Therefore, we reject all human inventions and laws introduced into the worship of God, here it comes, which bind and compel the consciences in any way. That's what, why it was so heavy for the people in the time of the Reformation. Their conscience was bound by Rome. The conscience of every worshiper we're confessing here must remain free. It has to remain free in the freedom for which Christ has set us free, Galatians 6. This is not a minor issue. Freedom of conscience is a massive issue. Freedom of conscience. Conscience may not be bound, it may not be compelled beyond what God in Scripture binds it and compels it. That's inferred. But humans may not bind it, the conscience, by the means of their own rules. Well, what exactly does this mean? Because this is kind of tricky. Sometimes in church life we, we hear of people responding to certain decisions of a consistory, whether it's here or somewhere else, and they might respond uh, negatively. You know, I don't agree with that decision of consistory. I don't think it's right. The consistory is binding my conscience. I can't go along with that decision. And then there can be more decisions that people don't care for, that, does, that someone doesn't agree with. And then the question comes up, if, if I don't agree with a certain decision of the consistory, does that mean my conscience is being bound? At what point does an issue become a binding of the conscience? Well, Article 32 zeroes in on two basic ways. If you notice, the footnote refers to Galatians 5 and Matthew 15, both of which we read. And the opening verse of Galatians 5 is very well known. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Don't go under a yoke of slavery. What's Paul talking about? What yoke is he referring to? 
Well, in the following verses, it becomes quite clear he's warning the Jewish Christians to whom he writes not to fall into the trap, because some people were trying to lure them there, the trap of trying to obey all of the laws of Moses, all the ceremonial laws. He mentions circumcision as just one example. Those laws that belong to the Old Covenant alongside of believing in Jesus and thinking that you need to do both in order to be saved. That was the threat that the Galatian churches were facing, this false teaching that you had to believe both in Jesus and in the laws of Moses, that is, performing the laws of Moses. Paul calls that a yoke of slavery. That is a binding of the conscience away from what God has told us in his word. He pinpoints the issue in Galatians 5 verse 4. You, if you, if you accept that false teaching, you are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. You've fallen away from grace. How have they done that? Because you're trying to save yourselves at least in part, and that's not possible. You're putting yourselves, Galatian Christians, right back into the slavery of works righteousness, right back into this idea that you have to earn your place in heaven by the merit of your good deeds. Oh, foolish Galatians, says Paul in the earlier chapters. If you do that, you will lose your freedom that you have in Christ. What does he mean by freedom? Well, it's just another way of talking about salvation. The salvation that God grants to His people through and in Christ by faith alone. Full stop. Any teaching or any law that is imposed upon the church which takes away that freedom, which takes away that salvation, such a rule or law must be resisted. If the ruling body of the church tells me that I have to secure my own salvation, even in part by doing certain actions here or following certain routines there or in any other way than by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that is an attack on my freedom. That is a matter of binding my conscience I may not believe that. I must not do that. It wasn't just the church and churches in Galatia that were facing this binding of the conscience. This was what Rome was doing. They were teaching the same sort of thing. Salvation by believing in Jesus. Oh yes, Jesus is part of the equation. But you also have to do good works, said Rome. It was Jesus plus. Church people were, were told, unless you do good works alongside of faith, unless you do things like confess your sins to the priest, wash, get washed with the water of baptism, the holy water, unless you fulfill the sacraments, at least if all the ones except marriage, you, you cannot be saved. Can you imagine the, the burden upon the conscience, consciences of everyday believers hearing these things? I mean, put yourself in their shoes. 1501, a Christian in, 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 in a church, a Roman church, hearing this taught. You're thinking to yourself, wait, how, how does this work? Like, how many good works do I need to do to really cancel out my sins? I don't know. How do I calculate that? And then when I sin, will that cancel out some of the deeds, the good deeds I have done? There is this torture of the sincere conscience going on. How do I know if my good works are really good enough to please God? 
For the average worshiper, there could be no peace of conscience. There could be no assurance of salvation. The conscience of the believer was afflicted. It was enslaved to the doubt that came with the false teaching. And so the Reformation battled valiantly to throw off that yoke of slavery and let the Christian live again in the true freedom for which Christ has set us free. Every believer may have firm assurance that all their sins are truly forgiven them by the grace of God only for the sake of the one sacrifice of Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross. Nobody should be left in doubt. So that was one way in Scripture time, Galatians, and Reformation time, even still today, that Christian consciences may be bound wrongly. The other way is to command church members to worship God in a manner which God Himself does not command in Scripture. So the Belgic singles out worship in this context when it says, therefore we reject all human inventions and laws introduced into the worship of God, which bind and compel the consciences in any way. These two things are closely related. If you believe a certain thing is necessary for salvation, like good works, that's going to impact how you worship God. If the church believes that a person is saved by faith plus good works, then the church is going to find ways to command good works of its members as part of their acceptable worship of God. And then because the Bible itself does not teach that, salvation plus works equals salvation, then the rulers of the church, they begin to invent ways to bring this practice into the church and again, this, was, this is not a new thing. We find it in Scripture already. Matthew 15, which we read. The Jews were doing this kind of thing. It was even so, says Jesus in that passage, that with their human traditions, their human commandments, things that God had not instructed, they were undermining the plain commandments of God. He points out that the fifth commandment of God's law, honor your father and your mother, was being undermined by the Jews' tradition or teaching that the people were to give their financial gifts to God as, and dedicate it to, the, to God first instead of helping their parents. Now, nowhere in Scripture does God ever say you should dedicate a gift to God in lieu of helping your parents instead of helping your parents. No. God's will was you honor your parents. You take care of mom and dad. As they get older, you look after them. And the Lord Jesus is angry. I don't know if you caught that when we read it. He has got holy anger going on. He says to them, you hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from, from me. In vain, means in emptiness, uselessness. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Their human commandments trumped God's commandment. And that is a no-no. Big time. The church must always worship God and direct its people to serve God in accordance with the commandments of God. This is a second commandment issue at the end of the day. The first commandment, you, you know that I think, is all about whom we are to worship. You are to have no other gods before me, so we are to only worship the one true God. The second commandment, that's about how we worship the one true God. We're not to do that by making figures and carved images, says the second commandment. We are to do that by how God wants us to, not by 
clever inventions, not by images, but by His Word. We worship God through His Word, through the preaching, through singing His Word back to Him and praying to Him. That is to be our, our guide, is, is the Word of God. Anything besides what is commanded in Scripture concerning how to go about worshiping the Lord, that's an invention of man, and it needs to be rejected. as it unlawfully binds our consciences. Well, once again, the Roman church did this and still does this kind of thing, instructing its members to confess their sins to the priests in order to receive absolution or pardon, instructing their members to do works of penance in order to earn forgiveness, to offer prayer to the saints, especially to Mary, to take part in the Mass, which is nothing less than an accursed idolatry. They insisted in earlier centuries at least to, that the people be taught by paintings and images rather than the Word of God, things they called books for the laity. All of these things were inventions of the Roman church, in human inventions, and all of them took away from the pure worship of God that He commanded in Scripture. And all of them became a needless, heavy burden on the consciences of the people. They had all these things they had to do. The yoke of Christ, however, as Jesus, Jesus Himself said, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. And He meant light on the conscience. It's light on the conscience because His salvation is a free gift given of grace. And the worship that He requires is thankful devotion to Him in spirit and in truth. Does the Lord want us to obey His commands? Of course He does. But here's the thing, never to earn a spot in heaven. That was the weight that Rome throws on it. Never to win the favor of God. Never to make God love us or find us acceptable. God already loves us. God already finds us acceptable through faith in Jesus. When we believe in Christ, then God sees us, as it were, through the filter of Christ. We become spiritually one with Christ. And when the Father looks upon us, it's as if He sees Jesus there. And in Jesus, there is no sin. That's how easy it is on our consciences to worship God, to approach His throne. Even think of the Ten Commandments that God commands of us. Do these create a burden? on our conscience? All of us will admit that struggling against sin, struggling to obey the commandments, yeah, that is a struggle. And we'll be struggling with it till the day we die, but it's not hard on our conscience, is it? We get our consciences cleared every day again when we go to the blood of Christ. And as we strive to obey those commandments and as we grow in that obedience, we find no troubled conscience. We find no distance between us and God. We only find a peace and a joy and a walking with Him in happiness. His burden is easy. His yoke is light. For all these reasons, the consistory has to be ever so very careful that no rules are made in the church which bind the conscience, that is, which take away from the freedom for which Christ has set us free, the freedom to serve Him also in accordance with His Word. Instead, any decisions any rules imposed must have the goal of preserving the freedom for which Christ has set us free. And when they do, then we as individual believers, we are free to submit. 
to these rules without any scruples of conscience, without any burdens in our minds. For rules, they need to be made. Many of the particulars cannot be found directly in the Bible, and we know that rules need to be made because Christ appoints elders to oversee the church. We've seen that in a previous sermon. He also told us through Paul in 1 Corinthians 14, all things should be done decently and in order. Apart from the matters of salvation and worship, how we are to worship, there are other rules which pertain to good order, which pertain to decorum in church. Things like, what time shall we hold the worship services? How are we to celebrate the Lord's Supper? How and when should we mark the ascension of Christ or Pentecost or Easter? In the Bible, the Good Shepherd very clearly commands his flock to gather for Lord's Day worship, but the Lord gives no direct command for when or how long the service must be. In the Bible, we are instructed about the elements of worship. We're commanded to pray. We're commanded to sing. We're commanded to confess our sins and receive grace. We're commanded to submit and listen to the preaching. We're commanded to give gifts to the needy. But nowhere are we taught the precise order in which these things must be done. We're commanded to use the sacraments, but the Bible does not specify exactly how we are to go about it. Should the church explain baptism and Lord's Supper before we conduct the sacrament? We did that this morning. We had a form for baptism read. Should we use a standard form, a standard explanation like that, or should the minister just freewheel it and explain it in his own words, or maybe prepare something in advance to explain it in his own words? Well, the Bible doesn't say exactly how this should be done. So, the consistory must decide on all things of that nature they either decide on them, uh, each consistory on its own, or a consistory may also decide to work together with sister churches and make a decision collectively, like we do in the Federation of the Canadian Reformed Churches. We do that by way of our church order. We touched on that last time, so we can be very brief. For some issues, every local consistory has voluntarily decided, you know what, we're going to consult our sister churches, and on this point, we're going to decide together how to do things. We as consistory think that's the wisest way to go. Let's write those things down in, a, in an agreement. We'll call that the church order, and then let's abide by those agreements. Keeping the church order, brothers and sisters, is a matter of keeping our word, our commitment, our promise. Now, for all these decisions that a consistory makes or that a federation of churches makes together, there will be reasons. They're not just pulling them out of a hat. There's going to be thought put into this based on the principles of Scripture. But having said that, there is at the same time freedom in making the particular decisions according to the time, circumstance, and wisdom of the elders or the wisdom of the churches in the federation. And some consistories and some federations of churches may make different reasons on certain points, different decisions for different reasons, and that is perfectly acceptable, so long as it's not going against Scripture. And so we have certain differences here and there. Some churches mark Ascension Day on Thursday night, the actual Ascension Day. We in Ancaster do it on a Sunday service. Either way is acceptable. 
Some churches celebrate the Lord's Supper seated at a table in the front of the church. We in Ancaster do it in the pew. These are matters of order and decorum. Each is acceptable. We may have our preferences, and we can speak and debate about advantages and disadvantages, and that's all well and good, but none of these are matters of conscience, you see, because none of these are commanded in Scripture in so many uh, precise words. God leaves His church free to decide how to go about these particulars, and He leaves the decision in the hand of the elders or in the hand of the elders and deacons, or then in the federation, if that's what the consistory decides. And that leaves every member, brothers and sisters, free to submit without having a pang of conscience. For the Bible's also clear on that side of things. Hebrews 13, obey your leaders and submit to them. For they're keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. So on the one hand, the consistory has a duty, and it's very weighty, never to impose things on the church that burdens the conscience. But on the other hand, members of the church have the duty to accept the authority and to willingly submit to their decisions and rules. I am not free to disobey the elders' decisions just because I don't like a certain decision. And if you don't think the minister doesn't like certain decisions sometimes, you'd be wrong. Oh, we have good talks in the consistory room, but sometimes I'm on the other side of the issue, but I still have to obey, and so do you so long as it's not against the Word of God. But my conscience may be free, you see. There's no scruple in it. And that's a good thing, brothers and sisters. That's a liberating thing for a Christian. God leaves me free to obey my leaders. The responsibility for the decision is in the leader's hands. It's not in my hands as an individual even if I think their decision is not the best decision. As long as it's not against the Word of God, as long as it doesn't make, break any of the promises we've made as church, by way of the church order, no one's conscience needs to feel weighted or burdened. So when I understand the difference between what God commands and what God permits, and the flexibility that there is within that permission. And when I remember that the elders of the church are appointed by the good shepherd, the Lord Jesus, to lead and guide the flock, then I'm free to follow my leaders without any pang of conscience or scruple, without feeling guilt in my heart. There may be certain decisions I do not care for, yet I cannot say they interfere with the pure gospel or that they add something man-made to the worship of God or that they break a promise, and so I will go along. And I will trust that the decision is for the best. Christ appointed these men to make these decisions, right? So my trust is in Christ who appointed elders and deacons to do their work. And then I will even make it my prayer that these decisions will be for the upbuilding of the church of Christ and for the glory of His name. So, brothers and sisters, let us keep ourselves in the freedom for which Christ has set us free, not making stumbling blocks out of things that ought not to be stumbling blocks, things that don't interfere with the pure gospel, things that do not undermine the pure worship of God, but on the other hand, never compromising if such things are imposed. Then we have to stand firm and say, no, we're not doing that. It's good to be watchful and vigilant, but it's also good to be submissive and obedient. So may the Lord Jesus fill us all with wisdom, the wisdom of His Spirit, 
that we may continue to live together as congregation and in the federation, joyfully in the bond of peace. Amen. Let's stand to sing together hymn, or rather Psalm 40. Psalm 40 stands as one and two. Let us together profess our Catholic, undoubted Christian faith. Let's do that by singing the Apostles' Creed in hymn number one.
in our prayer this afternoon, we're going to remember a nephew of Trevor and Vanessa Heckert, uh, Thomas Ludwig, who is a, a son of Dustin and Danielle Ludwig. He is to go in for surgery. Uh, apparently, he suffers from epilepsy, and the surgery is meant to reduce the brain seizure activity. So, as you can understand, it's a very delicate operation. We'll pray for the Lord's blessing upon that. Let us come to our God in prayer. Heavenly, faithful Father, how wonderful that You have set us free in Christ for freedom, freedom of conscience. It's the single biggest freedom we could have to not have a burden over against You, that there's something standing between You and us. We thank You that in Christ and in Him alone we have the complete forgiveness of all our sins by faith alone. Such a simple but profound teaching that continues to get attacked from various sides. And no wonder, because the devil wants to do his best to destroy the kingdom of Christ. And so lies pop up in church life, and doubts pop up in our own minds, and people accrue power to themselves in churches and impose upon your flock, things that ought never to be imposed, things which bind the conscience. Father, in your grace, pre prevent that from happening in Ancaster Church and across the Federation of Canadian Reformed Churches. We are not immune to such sinful impulses. We are not impervious to the attacks of Satan. So we pray for your spirit to be powerfully at work among us to preserve the simple, pure gospel in everything we do as church, in what we believe and profess, and in how we worship you. Let our worship be from the heart, and let it be in full accord with your word to the praise and glory of your great name. Father, we thank you for your care over us in so many ways. We lay before you this afternoon the care of our young brother Thomas Ludwig. We pray that you would calm him and his family as they prepare for his surgery tomorrow, big surgery, delicate, with its risks. We pray that you would encourage them all, also Vanessa and Trevor and their family, and we pray for success on this endeavor that the surgery may produce the desired results and that this young brother's symptoms of epilepsy may be reduced. Lord, encourage all involved, give healing from the surgery, and grant that in all these things, both families, all the extended family, may lean heavily upon you. We know that you are strong. You are all powerful, all mighty, and you want us to lean on you heavily. May they do that. May they feel your comfort and encouragement and strength and nearness. We pray for your blessing over the Bible study groups that are going on in Ancaster Church. We think of the men's and the women's and the young people's Bible studies. We also think of the discipleship groups and the prayer groups. We're thankful for all these various gatherings of brothers and sisters that want to grow deeper in their understanding of your word, that want to spend time praying together, encouraging one another, holding each other accountable. These are all good upbuilding Christian things. Bless each and every one that's involved. We pray for your blessing over the catechism instruction, 
over the uh, teachers that are busy preparing for that week over week, and the students themselves and the parents who send their young, uh, their children to these classes and who support them at home. Bless the parents in so doing. May they take good care and keep up with what's going on. And bless the students in their learning. May they learn well and grow in knowledge, but not just in knowledge, in faith, in a strength and confidence of the true faith. We thank you for the many gifts you spread throughout the congregation and for those who are using them in particular ways, those who are involved in serving the congregation. We think of our accompanists. We thank you for their, their service week after week and pray that you would bless each of them in leading the services. Encourage them in that work. We pray, uh, we, we thank you too for our caretakers and our sound technicians who do a lot of work behind the scenes. And yet that work too is vital uh, for the ongoing running of the church. Thank you for their care and their dedication. We thank you for the committee of administration and those who labor on it, looking after the, the buildings, looking after the finances, looking after the budget of the congregation, all of these practical matters, they are certainly matters that are important and belong to the running of the church. And we thank you for the faith, faithfulness of each of the members of that committee too. We thank you for the home mission committee and pray for your blessing over their endeavors. We thank you for their enthusiasm. Over the last year, they've really stepped forward and are endeavoring to lead us as congregation out into the community, organizing certain events, stimulating all of us to think and pray for and make steps toward reaching out to our neighbors. Bless them in these endeavors, in their plans, and may we not see this as simply the plans of a committee, but see their work as stimulating all of us as congregation to do that beautiful work of reaching out with the gospel. Bless our hospitality committee. We thank you for their care, their enthusiasm too, and wanting to set up events for the, the, the church and that we can be built up together as we uh, fellowship together. Bless them in their planning. And may we encourage them too with our participation as congregation. We thank you for the work of the refugee committee and how they're looking after the, the Carandish family Lord, this committee has a lot of work, has done a lot of work, and sometimes it's exhausting work. We will thank you for their endeavors. We pray that also others from the congregation can come forward to help out, to volunteer, to even replace a member or two as their terms come to their end. We thank you for the care that our Iranian families are experiencing and may they continue to settle in and flourish under your blessing. Father, we have so many blessings from your hand. We thank you for them all. We pray that you would build us up as your church, unify us, strengthen us, cause us to be a light on a hill indeed, and may we bring all praise and all honor to your great name. In Christ alone we pray. Amen. You may at this time bring your thank offerings to the Lord. After the offerings have been gathered, we'll rise and sing hymn 33, all four stanzas.
receive the blessing of the Lord and go in peace. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you.